Hi, in this video, I'm going to cover some of the basics um, dealing with the abuse of dominance, uh, abuse of dominant position, that is Article 102. Um, so let me start by saying that the origin of the prohibition of abuse of dominance is really the ECSC treaty, that is the treaty that established the European Community uh, on Steel and Coal, uh, where there was a provision, Article 66, Paragraph 7, that dealt with abuse of dominance. This then influenced what was to become currently Article 102 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. Now, the structure of Article 102 is, is fairly simple because compared with Article 101. Um, firstly, the subjective scope, um, Article 102 only applies or only creates obligations on undertakings that have a dominant position in a specific market. Uh, secondly, what is prohibited is not simply holding a dominant position, but rather the abuse of said dominant position. So the simple fact that you hold a dominant position is not illegal as such, but on the other hand, the fact that you have a dominant position also implies that you're subject to specific conduct rules under Article 102 that would not be applied to other companies. Thirdly, um, there is no exemption provision in Article 102, unlike what we saw in Article 101, where you have paragraph three that allows for the exemption of prohibited agreements, provided its, its requirements are met. So under Article 102, uh, the, the letter of the law is that there is no exemption. So there's no justified abuse. As we're going to see in this, um, in class, this is actually a point that has been clarified by the Commission and the Court, where they accept some sort of justification that performs a similar role to uh, Article 101, Paragraph 3. But we will look at that further on in our course. Now, the foundations for Article 102 are sometimes viewed as, as being um, the way to establish that Dominant firms are not illegal. Uh, however, they have to behave in a competitive manner. That is to say, they have to conduct themselves as if they were subject to competition, so-called as if competition theory, um, which is derived from um, some uh, German authors. Um, now, we can see that in the prohibition of some practices like excessive prices, and other exploitative abuses. As we know, one of the consequences of having uh, market power is the power over price, the power to maintain prices above their competitive level for a sustained period of time. Um, so by prohibiting as an abuse, uh, by prohibiting excessive prices, then we can see here a manifestation of the principle that firms holding a dominant position are not supposed to act uh, in exercising that power to the detriment of consumers. Now, in Continental Can, one of the major, one of the landmark cases by the European Court of Justice um, of 1973, the court has made clear that Article 102 is to be interpreted following a, a teleological uh, interpretation, as well as a systematic interpretation of Article 102 together with Article 101, and in fact also in view of the overall goals of the treaty. So conduct that affects the uh, structure of the market, even though it does not directly affect consumers or uh, trading partners to the dominant firm, um, such behavior is also subject to the prohibition. So conduct that harms the structure of competition may also run afoul of Article 102. Now, We've covered market power and the definition of the relevant market um, at the beginning of our course. Um, this is just a quick reminder that market power is currently the central element of um, the legal concept of dominance. And here you have paragraph 11 from the European Commission's um, guidance on enforcement priorities dealing with uh, exclusive, exclusionary abuses. So as you can see, the commission thinks that a firm that has substantial market power um, can be considered dominant. So 
it equates dominance with power over price or rather power over the relevant parameters of competition as price is not the only one. We also have other parameters like quality and consumer choice and um, privacy, innovation, etc. Now, market relevation, market definite, relevant market definition is something that the European Court of Justice has long established as a necessary step in the analysis of dominance. Um, and here you have an excerpt from uh, Continental Can, the, the Continental Can judgment in paragraph 32, where, as you can see, the court deems it of essential significance as in order to ascertain whether or not a firm has a dominant position over, uh, over the market, then you need to define the boundaries of the market as well as identify all the, rel all the relevant competitive constraints that may be faced by uh, said firm. Now, the dominant position was earlier on, or was defined in, in 1965 in a, in a guidance document by the European Commission as a position whereby one or more undertakings um, have the capability of influencing the decisions of other firms so that uh, a workable and effective competition is prevented from emerging and being maintained in the market concern. So this is quite clearly addressed at the power of dominant firms to have an influence on the decisions of other market players. The um, European Court of Justice then developed this concept, um, particularly in the United Brands judgment, a judgment that deals with um, uh, United Brands sale of Chiquita bananas in, in Europe. And in this 1978 judgment, uh, the court said, as you can see, that this dominant position is actually a position of economic strength um, that is enjoyed by an undertaking. Uh, and that position enables it to prevent effective competition uh, from being maintained uh, on the relevant market as it gives it the power to behave to an appreciable extent independently of its competitors, its customers, and ultimately its consumers. So we have both this element of power, of market power, together with an element of impairment of competition. That is the dominant position allows the dominant firm to impair effective competition. Now, in Michelin, the court uh, further stated that uh, being dominant in itself does not involve any negative judgment on the firm. It just means that if you are dominant, then you're subject to the rules of Article 102. But the court also went on to say something that has often been repeated in uh, the case law, as well as in the commission and uh, NCA practice. And that is this idea that the dominant firms have a duty not to allow their conduct to uh, further impair genuine undistorted competition um, on the single market. So there's this special duty not to impair effective competition, a special responsibility. As we will see in, when we look at some of the cases, um, this has really played the relevant role in uh, in some of the court's uh, practice. Okay, now uh, we've, we've seen this before as well that um, the first indication of uh, dominance is really market share. And that's why we need to define a relevant market so that we can establish what is the market share for that firm. So uh, the higher the market share naturally, then the stronger the assumption or the presumption that in fact, that the firm will be held dominant. Um, below 40%, the commission in its 2009 guidance now says that it is unlikely for a firm to be held dominant. There's been only one case and it was very, very close to 40%, uh, the British Airways case where the European Commission held that uh, British Airways was dominant. Um, between 40 and 50%, uh, the case law requires additional factors, uh, so market share by itself is not sufficient, we need additional fa factors in order to establish whether or not a firm is dominant. For instance, in the United Brands case, um, United Brands had 
developed branded uh, bananas, the Chiquita bananas, and this created a, a very specific and more inelastic demand for these branded bananas than the demand for um, other types of bananas. And the court also emphasized that um, United Brands was vertically integrated from production all the way down to the distribution in the, in the um, single market. And so that was also an advantage it had vis-a-vis -vis its competitors. And that strengthened the um, a point that even though it did not have 50%, it had about 45% of the mar of market share, that it still was a dominant firm. Now, once you reach the 50% threshold, so above 50%, then uh, the case law allows you to establish a presumption, a rebuttable presumption of dominance. So between 50% and 85%, you have this, pr this presumption. And naturally, the higher the market share, then the stronger the presumption will be, and more evidence will probably be required in order to rebut that presumption. Above 85%, uh, some case law has made it clear that you can have a conclusive evidence. So mere evidence regarding market share, as long as it is above 85%, can by itself be conclusive evidence of dominance, in which case you don't really need to look at other factors, although in practice, the commission and ANCs will normally try to add more evidence and not just rely on simple market share data. When you have state monopolies or exclusive rights, uh, you still need to have an analysis of the market in order to have uh, a sufficiently strong finding of dominance. Now, in addition to market share, as I mentioned, there are other um, factors that might be relevant, um, such as intellectual property rights, uh, patents, uh, copyrights, uh, trademarks, um, an analysis of barriers to entry and expansion, and other factors th that may create a competitive pressure on the allegedly dominant firm, such that it does not really have the power to behave to an appreciable extent independently of competitors' uh, actions. Now, in, in the 2009 guidelines, you will find um, Paragraph 16 and 17 of the guidance um, will refer to the issue of barriers to entry and expansion. And so here the idea is that even if a firm has high market shares, uh, provided you can find evidence that um, expansion or entry into the market is likely timely and sufficient in order to prevent that firm from exercising market power, then the firm may be held as not being dominant. And the final issue is countervailing power. That is to say, if a firm has a high market share, but then it faces a monopsony, it has only one client that comprises all or most of the demand for its products or services, then the ability of a firm, even with a high market share, to actually exercise market power may be countered by the fact that it faces uh, monopsonists on the other side of the market. And so that might also be one of the relevant factors in assessing dominance. Now, the Article 102 does speak of a, a dominant position held by one or more undertakings. Now, this creates sort of a paradox, because if you think of dominance as being sort of an absolute concept, then you know there the, the should be only one firm in the market that is really able to act independently of competitive pressures. In other words, you know, if, if dominance means that you're free to do whatever you want without con being constrained by the behavior of other market players, how can there be two firms in a market that have this ability? Now we will see, particularly in the chapter uh, dealing with mergers that this is actually something that may occur. That is to say, market power is not a, a, a question of an absolute, um, that there can be only be one firm with market power. Market power is actually a matter of degree. So you can have two or more firms that have market power and even significant market power. And uh, so you can have a situation where you have several firms 
that hold a dominant position in that market. Now, Article 102, by talking about the dominant position held by one or more undertakings, um, does cover this uh, possibility, but it tends to be narrowed to a very limited set of cases. So I'm not going to dwell on that here in this um, short video. Now, finally, let me give you some uh, sort of introductory remarks to the concept of abuse, and then we will look in, in our class, we will look at specific types of abuse of dominance. Now, uh, back in 1965, when the commission was looking at the concept and sort of trying to interpret the meaning of the concept of abuse, um, at the time there were still no decisions applying Article 102, um, the first decisions were from the late 1960s, early 70s. Um, the commission uh, proposed this concept that you have an abuse of dominance where the dominant undertaking uses the, the possibilities that uh, are afforded by the fact that it may behave appreciably to an extent that is not limited by the actions of other market players. And then an abuse would be uh, the use of that margin of, of, uh, of behavior in a way to obtain advantages that it could not have obtained had it been subject to effective competition. That is to say, had it been effectively constrained by competition, it could not have exercised market power or otherwise acted in a way that gives it an advantage to the detriment of its uh, partners, its trading partners, and ultimately of consumers. Um, now, uh, as we've seen, uh, the, the, the commission now sort of draws this concept mostly to the idea of power over price, although again, you know, power over other parameters of competition is also important. Now, when Article 102 began, it's, um, it's in, when, when the Commission began the enforcement of Article 102, there were two major theories as to the scope of abuse of dominance. Firstly, we have uh, the Belgian professor René Jolie, um, and René Jolie argued for a very narrow reading of Article 102. Uh, remember that Article 102, like Article 101, includes a number of examples of abuse. And for Professor René Jolier, when he looked at the different uh, provisions with the examples of abuse, he looked at that and he said, well, you know, the type of conduct that you find here, like, you know, excessive prices or unfair pricing and unfair terms of trade, um, the limitation of production um, in a way that damages consumers, uh, tying, and um, discrimination between clients or suppliers. Well, these are typically cases of abuses whereby the dominant firm exploits its trading partners, you know, be it its suppliers, its uh, distributors, or ultimately its consumers. So this is a, a case where you have the dominant firm exercising market power directly on its trading partners. So for him, um, basically the idea behind Article 102 was the, that the idea sort of like the as if competition theory that, okay, so the dominant firm is allowed to be dominant, but then we're going to regulate its behavior so that it does not exercise market power in a way that is detrimental to its trading partners and consumers. Now, the second uh, theory uh, was proposed by, um, the German law professor and Joachim Mestmaker, uh, was still the author of the, one of the classic treatises of EU competition law in German. And for him, this prohibition of abuse covered not only cases where the firm is exercising market power, but also cases where the firm is strengthening its dominant position by targeting competitors, by eliminating competition or otherwise hindering the competitive structure so that it will strengthen its dominant position in the future. So abuses against the competitive process would also be covered by Article 102. And as we will see in the case law, basically these two theories sort of correspond to what is today's view 
of the reach of Article uh, 102. Now, um, these theories have, have, have uh, sort of been incorporated into these two categories of abuse. Now, the mess maker theory uh, includes the so-called or exclusionary abuses. Um, exclusion, exclusionary abuses are market behavior by a dominant firm that impairs competition in a way that is not competition on the merits. Now, if a, a dominant firm is more efficient than its rivals, if it has a better product, better services, it's only natural that consumers would prefer, you know, whatever is supplied by the dominant firm. And we also know that even in perfect competition, if a firm is not efficient, then it will be kicked out of the market because more consumers will go to these more efficient firms because they have lower prices. And if your you know, marginal cost is above the market uh, equilibrium price, then you know, ultimately you're going to run out of money and you're going to leave the market. So the simple fact that firms are leaving the market all the time does not mean that they're being the victims of an abuse of dominant position. So the question is, well, but then if firms leave the market, but because they're being forced out of the market because someone is competing, not on the merits, but by using methods of competition that are seeking to um, impair consumer choice or to uh, affect the cost structure of those competitors, then that could be an abuse. Now, the commission guidance of 2009 is actually mostly focused on these exclusionary abuses. And the commission states in, in paragraph 19, as you can read in this slide that, well, what, you know, exclusionary abuses are really about safeguarding the competitive process in the single market. And so we don't want to allow these dominant firms to exclude competition on grounds that are not competition on the merits. So uh, the doing so, the commission also adds, you know, we're not protecting competitors as such. We're really about protecting competition as, as the process in, by which, you know, consumers can get um, better prices, better choice, better quality, and as well as innovation. So if competitors are not able to deliver that, then you know, they may be expelled from the market, but that's what we expect from competition. Now, this means that in order to determine whether or not the behavior of a firm is likely to uh, negatively impact competition, we use this concept of foreclosure and particularly anti-competitive foreclosure on the, of the market. Now, if you re remember the Delimitis case, the Stergis Delimitis case, where we had that uh, network of uh, beer distribution arrangements, you will remember that the problem in the Delimitis case was whether those networks of agreements between German brewers and German pubs, um, whether they led you know, to the exclusion of other competing beer manufacturers, beer manufacturers from other member states, because the competitive, a competing uh, beer manufacturer could not find a sufficient number of pubs available, you know, free of contract in order to contract with them the sale of its beer. So that's precisely the type of analysis that is at stake when we talk about foreclosure, you know, uh, locking down the market to other competitors. And this is the definition that the commission gives also in, in, in paragraph 19 of its guidance. Um, and note that the idea is again one that, you know, you're limiting access to competitors in such a way that the dominant position, the, the firm in the dominant position is or will be or will be in a better position to increase prices uh, in a way that is harmful to consumers. Now, there are two major categories of exclusionary abuses. Um, you have so-called price-based abuses, and then you have non-price abuses. Now, uh, this distinction has to do with how the abuse manifests itself, or rather the immediate object of the abusive conduct, whether it is you know, related to the prices 
charged by the dominant firm or whether it relates to other types of conduct that may also impair effective competition. Uh, furthermore, uh, and we will see that in, in looking at the cases, the, these two types of abuses, of exclusionary abuses, price and non-price abuses, are actually um, interchangeable. That is to say, a firm may use a, a price type abuse to achieve exactly the same goals of eliminating competition as it could by using a, a price abuse. So um, this is one of the reasons why the commission in, in the past decade or so has argued in favor of what it calls an effects-based approach. So rather than being focused on the form of the conduct, you know, whether it is a pricing abuse or non-pricing abuse, what really matters is you know, what is the likely effect of this um, allegedly abusive conduct. Now, there is also an underlying assumption behind this distinction between pricing and non-pricing abuses. Um, as we've seen in other areas of EU competition law, um, particularly for economists, but ultimately for uh, competition agencies and courts as well, it's often easy to identify a pricing uh, pricing conduct and to make a judgment as to its anti-competitive nature than when we talk about non-price uh, conduct. And why? Well, because if you have pricing behavior, then you can, you can apply this test, so-called uh, the, the as efficient competitor test in order to distinguish between abusive and non-abusive uh, competition. And um, we're going to look at, at both types of abuses, but first let me uh, just show you something about price-based abuses. Uh, now, price-based abuses are abuses where uh, the, the as efficient competitor test may be applied. And as you can see in paragraph 23 of the 2009 guidance, um, the commission says, well, we're only going to intervene if the exclusionary abuses are likely to lead to the exclusion of an as efficient competitor, of a competitor that is as efficient as the dominant undertaking. Now, I, I note here in this slide that, you know, this, this is an interesting uh, concept, but it also has its own problems. Now, one of the issues that I find puzzling is that if the test to determine whether or not there has been an abuse depends on whether or not the excluded or the targeted competitor is as efficient as the dominant firm, to me, this is problematic because how do you know? If you are a competitor, how do you know if you're as efficient as the dominant firm? You know, efficiency has to deal with information on costs and pricing. And you know, a competitor will not be aware of the marginal cost or the overall uh, costs, the total costs of a dominant firm. It will be aware of its own costs and it might have a you know, reasonable estimation of the costs of the dominant firm, but it is really not sure whether or not it is an as efficient competitor. So ultimately, um, you know, the firm is a complainant that believes it's being harmed by a, the, as if by a dominant firm, you know, is really in a situation of uncertainty. It does not really know whether or not this is an abuse because it does not know exactly whether or not it is as efficient as the dominant firm. Now, and, and there's also another issue that, you know, ultimately this is like a bit like Schrodinger's cat in, in physics that you only really know whether pricing behavior by a dominant firm is an abuse once you can pair that behavior with the dominant firm's costs. Because if, if the pricing behavior would not exclude an as efficient competitor, then it is not an abuse. On the other hand, if it is, you know, if it would lead to an as efficient competitor being expelled from the market, then it is an abuse. But until you sort of open the box to see, you know, whether the costs of the dominant firm are covered by the current pricing practice or not, 
you're not really sure whether or not there has been an abuse. So the concept of abuse becomes quite subjective uh, in a sense. Now, if this is so, if there are these disadvantages, then why was the test adopted? Well, um, there was one major complaint by dominant firms uh, with regard to the enforcement of Article 102 by the European Commission, as well as by the European Court of Justice. And that was the complaint that, you know, um, the, um, the European Commission imposes all these obligations, but, you know, we're not really sure uh, to, you know, what are our duties? What exactly is an abuse? What are we allowed to do? What are we not allowed to do? Now, by using this standard, the as efficient competitor standard, since the dominant firm knows its costs, it is able to um, tell in advance whether or not an intended course of conduct would constitute an abuse. Um, and so it is able to predict with legal certainty whether or not its behavior may be considered to be an abuse of dominance. And that's mostly one of the sort of main reason to use this um, concept. Okay, now just a final note and we'll talk about the uh, exploitative abuses uh, later. Um, just a note on, on concepts of cost. Now, uh, the European Court of Justice, particularly in the AXO case, which is a predatory pricing case, uh, the European Court of Justice uses this concept of average total cost and the concept of marginal cost. Now, the concept of average total cost means that, you know, for a given output, you take into account all the costs and you divide it by the number of units produced. The marginal cost, on the other hand, measures the cost of producing an additional unit. Now, um, the, the European Commission in its 2009 guidance um, replaces these two concepts, the average total cost and the marginal cost, with these two other concepts that I've signaled here in red. That is the average avoidable cost and the long run average incremental cost. Now, the average avoidable cost stands as a proxy for the marginal cost. As I mentioned earlier, you know, it's very hard to precisely identify marginal costs. So the commission uses the average avoidable cost. And the concept follows a, a very simple intuition. You know, um, what is the cost of producing an additional amount of output, you know, that you, you know, if you didn't produce that, you know, what, how much would you save? You know, what are the costs of producing specifically this increment uh, of production, this extra output? So the reason for this is that, you know, if your prices do not cover the average avoidable cost, then basically you're throwing money out of the window, you know, because you're, you know, spending 600 to gain 500. Um, it is irrational behavior because if you know that you're going to receive 500, then why would you cast, would spend 600, you know, when that will mean that you will lose 100. And behavior such as this tends to indicate that there's no valid business reason behind it, you know, that you know, if, if you are an as efficient competitor, uh, this means that you're going to lose money if you try to meet the dominant firm's price. So in a sense, you can presume, you know, and it is a strong presumption that, you know, the reason behind uh, deliberately losing money with each sale is really because you want to eliminate your competitors. Um, in some cases, the, the commission also talks about the average variable cost um, which will typically be the same as the average avoidable cost, since um, you can only avoid, in the short run, you can only avoid variable costs, um, you know, not buying uh, raw materials to produce the goods, but you still have to, you know, pay for the investment in the plant and in machinery, et cetera. So that's the intuition that if price is below average avoidable cost, then you're sacrificing profits. And why would a, 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 a maximizing firm, uh, a revenue maximizing firm deliberately lose money? You know, that's sort of intrinsically suspicious, particularly if you're talking about the dominant firm that by definition has market power. Now, 
what happens if the firm is able to cover its, its long run costs? Well, if it's covering its long run costs, then it is not technically losing money. And in that case, as long as prices cover its, um, in this case, so-called long run average incremental cost, then you know uh, the firm is acting in a rational way because it's covering all its costs. Now, uh, long run average incremental costs includes both variable as well as fixed costs in order to produce uh, a certain amount of, of output. And so the commission uses this sort of as a upper upper boundary, you know, above long run long range uh, average incremental cost uh, prices will not typically be deemed to be um, uh, abusive or suspicious uh, from the commission's perspective because you know an as efficient competitor is perfectly able to sustain its position in the market uh, because if it is as efficient as the dominant firm and the price is above long range incremental average costs then you know the firm is cap perfectly capable of selling profitably and covering its Okay, and I'll conclude this uh, first video from right now, and I'll see you in class. Bye.